All right, so my name is David Butts. I'll introduce myself a little bit more completely in a moment. Um, what I'm being tasked with doing is talking about the basics of hospital economics and purchasing. Um, I'll start out with a disclosure. Can, can you hold one second? I'm having an echo. Can I? Um, yeah. I'm You're okay. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm an adjunct uh, faculty member at the Ross School of Business. I teach a class to MBAs and graduate students around the university, uh, sort of a boot camp uh, on the business of healthcare. And you'll see my bio there. My slides are a little bit loaded. I'm hoping that you'll find value in coming back to them later, but that gives you a little sense of who I that am. The most important am. Uh, information most on this important. slide, I think, is my contact information. And I have some ideas for folks on where they might uh, get data on the industry or on their particular market segments. Um, if you email me uh, with questions, I might be able to, to help you out. So uh, keep that in mind. So we, we have this uh, business model canvas, and it's a, it's a great tool. Um, I'm tasked with looking at the cost structure and the revenue streams associated with uh, hospitals purchasing decisions. And we have a bit of a problem to start out in that it, it, it isn't very transparent what, what healthcare costs. And I'm going to take the first 10 minutes or so um, and ask this question what does it cost to deliver healthcare? To deliver and I'm healthcare. going to try and disabuse you of a few notions you may have about the cost of providing have. care and, and provide a little more transparency to the issue. Uh, one of the problems we face is that the costs we are talking about are, are all over the map. There isn't one metric that we deal with when we talk about costs. There may be many. So the, the highest reported cost is going to be the bill charge that shows up on a patient's uh, bill when they get it in the mail. Uh, that's a list price. Uh, very few uh, patients or very few payers actually pay full bill charges. There are discounts uh, typically negotiated across the board. Um, at the other extreme, the lowest co way to measure cost might be through an invoice cost. So the, the costs that we see for care are wildly different across the metrics that we may use to measure those costs. And for the same metric, uh, you may have entirely different reported costs across hospitals uh, for, for no other reason than overhead is allocated differently at hospital A than it, than it may be at hospital B. So one, one reason we have confusion over costs is we have all of these metrics kind of flying around at the same time. Um, let, let me give you an example. Um, there is a new drug out for hepatitis C. I'm sure you've, many of you have read about it. It's $84,000 for a full course of treatment. Um, and the focus there that you would see in the New York Times or in various other venues is on the reimbursement. What does it cost the health insurer uh, to, to reimburse the cost of that medication? Um, in another context, uh, same idea of a medication, um, you have a really simple purchasing decision when you're talking about two drugs that are chemically identical and therapeutically equivalent. Uh, if drug A is a branded medication and drug B is a generic alternative, they'll have different invoice prices, but everything else about the drug will be more or less the same. They'll have the same supply chain costs. They'll have the same cost of dispensing the drug to the bedside and delivering it to the patient. They may have the same overhead markups. They may have the same uh, efficacy. Um, but of course, uh, because the invoice price of the generic is lower, hospitals will typically choose uh, the generic drug. And so when you look at the costs of those, um, the bill charge that shows up on the patient's bill in the mail may be $40 different between the two medications. Um, but when you look at the cost of the loading dock, you know, coming into the formulary to the, phar to the pharmacy, uh, the invoice cost may be only $4 difference. Now, um, again, the bill charge isn't paid by anybody, um, and in this case, um, when you extract away from all of the um, superfluous stuff, the overhead charges and so forth, really the relevant difference in cost is $4. So we have costs uh, measured in a variety of ways. I want to reiterate that when you look at bill charges in healthcare, um, especially on the hospital and health system charge side of things, the markups are huge, and they've been growing over time. So this is a graphic taken from Medicare. And um, you know, in, as recently as 2002, prices were marked up 139% on average. So $100 cost would turn into $239 on the patient's bill. You can see there by 2011, the markup was 229%, and it's grown significantly since then. So, so keep in mind, when you see the bill, 
Um, that's not really the cost. Nobody, very very few people are actually paying the full price uh, that's listed there. So you know, here's the dilemma that we have when we're looking at uh, hospitals and how they make their purchase decisions: is nobody really knows what stuff costs, um, and it's it's not just the patient who doesn't see this transparently, but it's oftentimes the the individual provider as well. And even adding a little bit of transparency. Uh, can dramatically change the way decisions are made. So just making physicians aware of the cost of a blood test um, can lower a hospital's daily bill by as much as 27%. So um, as we're looking at costs, we need to appreciate, and I'm sure many of you do, uh, that the costs aren't always um, as obvious as they could be. And I, I just want to make this point about hospital charges one more time. This graph, and I won't go into it, if you're interested, you can look at it later, looks at bill charges for C-section deliveries. And this is 2009, but the website is listed there. You could go look at any procedure you wanted to. Uh, you know, the charges that are uh, billed to patients by hospitals that have at least 30 of these C-sections, you know, vary from less than $10,000 at five hospitals to more than $40,000 at eight hospitals and you, in California. And you see everything in between. So the one takeaway that I, that I hope you get from these first few slides is, you know, bill charges mean almost nothing. Uh, it's a list price. Uh, very few people, very few insurers actually pay that. But what I, I want to direct your attention to is this just absolutely fabulous um, website called HCUPnet. Some of you may have heard of the National Inpatient Sample. This is a query tool that allows you to look at the national inpatient sample and get some aggregate statistics. So this is an all-payer database. It covers all inpatient, all emergency department care, all hospital care. It's just a terrific uh, query tool, and it aggregates in myriad different ways patient-level data um, so that you can get a sense of what things actually cost. And let me direct your attention to this slide where you can get some aggregate-level um, insights into what, what hospital care costs on an aggregate basis. So in 2009, if you look at the top uh, slide there, or top line in Exhibit 1, there are about 39 million total hospital stays in 2009. If you go down to the red box, and I'm just going to summarize here, the mean charge for a hospital stay in the United States in 2009 was about $31,000. The actual cost of delivering the care was about nine. And I think here in 2014, you can probably round that to 40,000 is the average bill that comes to a patient's home, and 10,000 is the actual average cost of doing it. And so that's the number that you're working with. If you're providing a therapy for inpatient care, you know, that's kind of the budget uh, that, that, that uh, folks are working with. And um, before I actually get into a particular example, this HCUPnet tool, and if you just Google HCUPnet, it'll come, come right up, you can look... Um, at a whole variety of things. You can look by diagnosis, you can look by procedure, you can get statistics on all hospital stays, you can look at trends going back to 1993, you can rank uh, the diagnoses or procedures. You don't have to look at inpatient stays, you can look at ED visits, you can look at readmission rates. It's just a fabulous tool. It's, it's one of 10 databases that I would love to tell you about. I, you know, talking, li listening to some of you earlier, I have some ideas. So if you want to talk about where you might go get data to do, de to do due diligence, uh, uh, email me at that, that contact. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, let me talk about heart failure. Somebody brought up heart failure. Um, you can go into HCUPnet and say, well, how many people are admitted with a principal diagnosis uh, uh, with, of heart failure in the United States across all roughly 5,000 hospitals? Well, there are about 876,000 admissions for heart failure. So that's a quick way to find out what the size of the inpatient market here is. And you can just look down. The length of stay is 5.2 days on average. The median length of stay is four. The mean charges for a, a heart failure stay, uh, with, with, again, that's the principal diagnosis, are about 41,000. The mean costs are about 11,000. And so they'll, they'll aggregate the costs for you. This is just a great tool for you to get a sense of, of what the market looks like. Um, and let me now talk about the costs because, uh, again, if you look at that previous slide, um, the average bill for a patient admitted with heart failure as their principal diagnosis is $41,000. The cost, though, is about a quarter of that. It's about $11,000. And I think what you can assume in most cases is that the, the actual costs that you can identify with a patient are about 40% of that. So $4 out of every 10 
that goes into inpatient care, you can actually tag to a particular patient. So the medication they received, the nursing, um, you know, particular test that they had, about $6 out of every 10 is overhead. Right? And, and we call those um, unit overhead or, or a fixed direct cost and indirect overhead, which is you know, the CEO's salary, the billboard on I-94, the subsidy to the cafeteria, the information system. So you, know, you get this impression when you think about inpatient care that, oh my gosh, we bill for everything. Hospital care is you know, exceedingly expensive, and in fact it is, um, but the, uh, the budget that you're working with to actually care for a patient, in this case, is only about $4,000. So when you're thinking about what the value proposition is for your therapy, uh, you're not working with 41000 and you can't just sort of bill for it and expect to get reimbursed. What you're really working with is, is a number that's about a tenth of what would show up in the bill charges. And, and again, you can go into HCUPnet and, and figure this out. When I talk to my MBAs, I, I say divide the bill by 10. That's, a, you know, as a rough rule of thumb, uh, that's basically the, the direct cost of patient care that you're going to be able to work with. So I would say stay focused on variable direct costs. When you look in HCUPnet and you see the procedure or you see the particular diagnosis that you're looking at, you know, take the actual cost and take about 40% of that as being the variable direct cost. That's, you know, for, for, for your needs, that's probably a pretty good, you know, start to think about what hospital care costs. And, and your therapy's financial impact is almost certainly going to be 100% on the variable direct cost because if you have a therapy that's being administered to a patient, um, that's that's where it's going to show up. So um, I'm going to steal this from the uh, last Friday. I, I, I hope that's okay. Um, this workflow is, is terrific. Um, I think it's generic in the sense that I think it could generalize to a whole variety of settings. I'm going to steal it and, and basically say I'm going to take out the particulars there and just make it generic. So you have an attending physician who on behalf of a patient is placing an order through what's these days is called a CPOE, or Computerized Physician Order Entry. There may be a technician involved who actually does the test, and the results of that test would go to a physician specialist. What I want to point out here is that uh, I've added, I've embellished the previous slide a little bit. There are typically two bills generated here, two claims being generated here. One is for the facility, so the hospital will generate a bill. Right, and that will go to the insurance company, and the physician will generate a separate bill for the professional services. So there's a facility fee and a professional fee in, in, involved here, and uh, those are both denoted on this graph. So what you're seeing in HCUPnet and what you're seeing from the hospital's perspective is, is typically the, just the facility charge, but the, the physician also bills. Um, I, I want to point out here that coding is, is how you get reimbursed. So you need a procedural code and you need a diagnostic code, um, and insurance companies just won't reimburse you for putting down any diagnosis, any procedure. You have to demonstrate the medical necessity. So every time you uh, do a procedure or um, provide a medication or any kind of therapy, the claim that you submit to the insurance company has to include both a diagnosis and a procedure, and then there has to be, in some sense, a reasonable link between that um, diagnosis and the procedure being done, and it's also important to recognize here that the aim of coding isn't simply to get paid. That's one element of what's going on here, but coding is important for a whole variety of other reasons. I'm, I've just listed in there. I'm not going to go through all of them, but, but it's a very complex process to figure out for your therapy um, how it is going to be registered and documented and uh, uh, deemed reasonable. So um, I, I won't go into coding. I don't have enough time here. But, but again, if, uh, I, I'm not an expert in coding, but I have just an, enough knowledge of the field to be dangerous. If you have sort of generic questions about this, uh, e email me, and I'd be happy to go through them with you. Um, here's a little bit of background on diagnosis and procedure codes and, and where they would show up. I can give you a quick 10-minute primer over the phone on, on this if you uh, just contact me. Um, but what's, what, one of the things that's important to recognize here is that getting your therapy approved and in use um, requires all of these various parties to weigh in. They're weighing in partly on the basis of the value proposition, but a lot of what they're weighing in, in, in on is just the logistics of getting this approved. Will Blue Cross you know, accept this and reimburse it? What do we have to do to get it reimbursed? And um, what, what I want to point out here, and I'm going to skip ahead for one second and then go back, at a hospital the size of the University of Michigan, there are going to be 15,000 or more 
intermediate product codes. And your therapy is going to be one of those 15,000. So the amount of uh, attention uh, that you're going to get or mind share that you're going to get from the University of Michigan is one fifteen thousandth uh, of the total uh, resources that they have available for this. So to get your therapy approved, you know, it needs to have a code associated with it. It needs to have a diagnosis that goes behind it and justifies it. It needs to go into the cost accounting system. It needs to be de- de- called what's called an intermediate product code. Um, the cost accountants need to figure out how much overhead to allocate to it. Um, it needs to be introduced into the charge master so it can be billed for. And then there's a whole series of events that, that have to occur. It's called the revenue cycle before you actually get reimbursed. So there's just a lot of, of hoops to, to jump through here, even if the value proposition is very, uh, very easily defined. So, um, again, there are a lot of details to work out. There are issues of governance. Who's responsible for this therapy? Um, who's ordering, inventorying these various things? Is, you know, is it pharmacy that's doing that? Is it the cardiologist that's doing it? Um, so when you see people gathered around the table, um, and I'm going to skip forward here just a second. Uh, Rats, I missed it. Come back. When you see people gathered around the table, I had to, another thing. Yeah, they're, they're they're deliberating over value propositions, but they're also exchanging information, talking about logistics, talking about accountability. How are we going to track the use of this therapy? Um, there's just a lot going on that has to be worked out. And I think there's an expectation on the part of all these around the table that it's easier for you to work this out and have it adopted by 5,000 hospitals than it is 5,000 hospitals each to work it out and, and, and figure things out with Blue Cross Blue Shield on their own. So um, that's one of the big takeaways that I have for you here is it's, it's not about the value proposition. And I'm stating the obvious, I know. but um, there, are, there are a lot of details to work out, and, and you can do it, in their opinion, more easily than they can do it themselves, and there is something to be said for that. So um, you know, keep all of that in mind. I, I don't exactly know how much more time I have, but there, there are a thousand points of veto here. That's uh, my, one of my er, erstwhile colleagues uh, at the University of Michigan, who's now moved on, loves to talk about the thousand points of, of veto as a surgeon at the University of Michigan Health System. It just seems like everywhere you turn, somebody can block any initiative you want to take. And oftentimes it's because the, the whole process of just getting reimbursed, getting it stocked, getting it dispensed involves so many different people. The revenue cycle is so complicated. Uh, there is a slide at the end here which talks about revenue cycle. And you miss one link in the revenue cycle and you don't get paid. And there are dozens and dozens of links so um, it's not unreasonable for the folks who are guarding those individual links to, to sort of hold up the process and say, wait, you know, wait a second, my, I only have leverage at this particular moment because I'm a guy who works in the sub-sub basement. And if I don't speak up now, I'll never get an opportunity to complain again. And so um, when you talk about procurement and purchasing, you know, a lot of people are going to weigh in. Um, so, um, all right. Um, so it, it, it is important to realize that these folks who are trying to help you are, are well-intentioned people. I, you know, my experience, and I worked full-time in the hospital for quite some time, is that they really are at the bedside. They desperately want to do the right thing for the patient, or they're working passionately behind the scenes. They're, they're not an adversary, um, but they do have legitimate concerns that they need to address. Their lives are just miserable for a, a lot of them. They're dealing with bureaucracy and red tape. Um, and, and their lives are made harder by just a whole lot of, of nonsense. The expertise that they have and the decision making that they're doing is often very siloed. Um, you know, I had an experience when I first went to work at the U of M Health System. I moved over from the business school. Um, was the cost accountants weren't talking to the people who made up the charge master, and it just led to this multi-million dollar um, loss for the. University of Michigan Health System because the people who were figuring out what to charge were charging enough given how much overhead was being allocated to the devices in question. And, you know, all I did was close the loop and tell the cost accounts they had to talk to the people who were setting up the charge master and vice versa. And um, I paid my salary over like 10 times that year. Um, so it's it's very complicated. And, and time is the ultimate scarcity for these folks. I mean, they're just overwhelmed with the tail. And you have to have a burning platform for them. You have to sort of say, this is not just something that's a good idea. Because if you have a good idea, that's great. Just go get in line because there are a lot of people who have good ideas. 
um, that they need to understand the urgency around your therapy as well. Um, again, uh, I want to go back to HCUPnet. It's not just diagnoses that this provides information for. So I have here um, knee repl- no cardiac pacemaker. Um, so procedures are also covered in HCUPnet in the exact same way. So the mean charges in 2012 for an inpatient stay that involved this particular procedure were uh, basically $100,000. The mean cost, including, I'm sure, the device was about $27,000. If the variable directs are, are 40% of that, you know, you're talking about roughly eight to $10,000 associated with the actual cost that you can identify with the patient. You can look at trends, mortality. HCUPnet is just a, a terrific tool for you to, to use. So um, I, I'm, I, I hope that's helpful. Um, and I, have, I think we have a few minutes left that I could take some questions. And, and moreover, um, I'm just going to say it again. There's my contact information. If you want some ideas about where you can go grab some data or just how you might look into the cost uh, and the purchasing decision around your therapy, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. I think that's great, David. I think that's great, David. Thank you very much. I had a question, I had a question for you, actually. So you talked about these. Am I on? You talked about these 15,000 different product codes exist in the hospital. If you're developing a new therapy, are you going to be one of these 15,000 product codes or are you going to be lumped into a procedural code? I've heard about these procedural codes that kind of encompass all aspects of a given procedure, including the drugs, the devices, the drapes. Is it an individual code for my product or am I going to be part of a, of a procedural code? Um, in most cases, um, if it's sufficiently expensive, you'll have your own intermediate product code. So uh, in the OR, if you're a device, for example, that costs $4,000, you will be an intermediate product code and you will show up in the charge master. So the intermediate product code will identify, say, the invoice price, the, the stocking cost, and then it'll allocate some overhead and there'll be a markup and you'll be in the charge master. Um, if it's a smaller procurement, if it's gauze or saline, um, it may be lumped into a, a bundle called surgical supplies for which there's a sort of a standard fee that the OR would charge, um, you know, for a base set of surgical supplies. But to the extent that you can identify this, to the extent that the hospital can be reimbursed for it, um, it would show up both as an intermediate product code and it'll be costed and it'll show up as well as a, uh, as a charge. David, this is Tim Cornell, and I just have one quick question. Does the database you uh, talked about have pediatric data? Uh, yes, so it, it it actually does have separate information just on children's hospitals, I believe, but it, it will include data for all inpatient admissions in the United States. So it's a 20% sample that they then extrapolate across to the entire uh, U.S., you can break it out rural versus metropolitan. You can break it out teaching hospitals versus non-teaching hospitals. And I think you can, no, in fact, I'm certain you can look by age demographic. Um, and it's not just inpatient care. It would be emergency department care, and it would be psychiatric hospitals as well. Um, so so if, you, if you go to the site, it'll give you a lot more detail on, on what the data are that drive this. And I'll say one other thing. If uh, you find these data useful, uh, they are data that are aggregated from patient-level de-identified data. And for, I think, $300, you can buy an entire year's worth of data. So you could buy 2012, which would have a 20% sample, so roughly 8 million inpatient stays across the United States. And that will have an extraordinary amount of detail. It'll give you secondary diagnoses, up to 24 of them. It'll give you up to 24 uh, procedure codes. And, it, you know, if you are able to sort of manage 8 million lines of data, um, I think you might find even more insights by getting the patient level uh, counterpart. Great, thanks. 